Lord Jesus, if only you would come to our city like you did that day to Jerusalem. We've got we some great, great hymns, hymns to sing to welcome you. you. We have a special anthem, and you would get a really great carpet welcome. Five-star dream. There would be a real religious <clears throat> revival. It would be wonderful if only you would come here and rescue us. But in the that you do, just not be a word of advice. Stick to religion, but be careful. Don't interfere with our thoughts on current affairs or politics or how we spend our money. Oh, and be careful not to make strange changes in the way we do things around here. Save us from what might happen in the next life, yes. But we need to go down, we need to go our own way in the here and now. We just don't want you to get anything wrong. We're cheering for you. But there are other people, you know, who might not be as gracious as we are. Our first hymn is All Lord, Glory, Laud, and Honor, number 196. Distance 
instead of bigger tables to invite more guests. The we, the builders of these hardships, have rejected you, the good shepherd and the king. Give us courage to offer hospitality instead of hostility. Give us strength to accept your call upon our lives. Give us righteousness that we might know the difference between what is easy and what is right. Amen. Good news. We do not have to only be parade people. We can become reliable, grounded, and centered. We can greet Jesus with joy. We can remain with him with open hearts. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven indeed. Thanks be to God, we are offered new life. Our next hymn is Let Us Break Bread Together, number 525. <laughs> Established it on the seas. God set it firmly on the waters. Who can ascend the Lord's holy mountain? Who can stand in his sanctuary? Only the one with clean hands and a pure heart, the one who has not made false promises, the one who has not sworn dishonestly. The kind of person receives blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God who saves. And that is how things are with the generation that seeks him that seeks the face of Jacob's God. Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates, and be lifted up, ye ancient doors, so that the King of glory can come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and powerful, the Lord powerful in battle. Lift up your heads, ye mighty gates, and be lifted up, ye ancient doors, so the King of glory can come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of heavenly forces, he is the glorious king. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Testament reading, our gospel reading, is uh, Mark 11, 1 through 19. And this is the story of Palm Sunday as Mark tells it. Um, the gospels all kind of tweak it. And so um, I want to make sure that I add that little disclaimer that this is in particular Mark's story. And he adds a couple pieces to this um, that are meaningful and really kind of 
help, help us get a fuller picture of what's going on in Jesus' heart during this time. Mark 11, 1 through 19, the word of God for us today. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage, Bethany at the Mount of Olives, and Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, Go into the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you'll find there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, It is the master who needs it, and he will send it back right away. They went and found a colt tied to a gate outside a street, and they untied it. Some people standing around said to them, What are you doing untying this colt? And they told them just what Jesus said, and they let them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. And many people spread out their clothes on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. After he looked around at everything, because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. The next day after leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. From far away he noticed a fig tree and leaf, so he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing except leaves, since it wasn't the season for figs. So he said to it, No one will ever again eat your fruit. His disciples heard this. They came into Jerusalem after entering the temple. He threw out those who were selling and buying there. He pushed over tables used for currency exchange and the chairs of those who sold doves. He didn't allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. He taught them, hasn't it been written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've turned it into a hideout for robbers. The chief priests and the legal experts heard this and tried to find a way to destroy him. They regarded him as dangerous because the whole crowd was enthralled by his teaching. When it was evening, Jesus and his disciples went outside the city. The word of the Lord. So last year um, on Palm Sunday, I talked to you about how Jesus was making fun of Pilate's entry into the city with his great army and horses and weaponry and armor and the pomp and circumstance, people would have turned out for that parade just to see it, just to see the power on display from Rome. They would have come from a, a port town just, just up on the seashore there into Jerusalem for the week, just a few days before Jesus chose to arrive himself and arrive in a way that poked fun at that parade. And I gave you details about that last year, and we talked about that. That's not where my head is this year, though. My head has to do more with his agenda and what he's accomplishing. And I'm not, I'm not even able to get my arms around why. I'm not going to go there today. But what? What's he doing? And Mark shows us better than any gospel what Jesus is doing. Because there's a little detail. Right at the end of the poem study, right at the end of today, um, for one thing, we see that this entrance happens sort of later in the day than you would think. It's not a morning event. How do we know this? Did anyone spot how we know? He would return to Bethany at night. He, he goes from the parade straight to the temple, but it's essentially closed for the day. There's nobody there doing anything. So he walks around gets a lay of the land, and leaves. Why did he go straight to the temple? Because he's got plans. And he wanted to do it then. He wanted to enter Jerusalem, go straight to the temple, and rip it apart. He didn't want a break. He went from A to B. And when he found that B wasn't viable, that the stores had closed, he left. But we can see what kind of mood he was in for having had to do that. Because when he gets up the next day, what does he do when he sees that fig tree? 
versus it. No, for nothing. nothing. <laughs> the tree did nothing wrong. The tree wasn't in season. There weren't supposed to be figs on it, and he curses it anyway. Grumpy much. <laughs> Jesus' intention, according to Mark, is to enter Jerusalem in a way that pokes his nose at Rome, who happens to be there that week in all of its glory. So it's not like they're away and they'll hear rumors of this. They're there. But he doesn't stop with going after Rome. His intention is to go straight from making fun of Rome to the temple itself. Who's he leaving out? Who's he not picking a fight with? That's why I say to you, I can't do why today. It's too big a question to do in the time we have. But do you see what he's doing? Do you see with some clarity that these are choices he's making? He decided to do these things. And it sheds some light on the reluctance of the disciples to embrace it. Shortly before this event, Peter pulls Jesus aside and says, we're not doing it. You're not going to Jerusalem. We're not going to follow you there. This is a bad idea. And Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. We are going to Jerusalem. It is my plan. <clears throat> I think one of the biggest differences, there are a lot between me and Peter, is I probably just give up then. Peter gives up later. The very best we can be as followers of Jesus is outlined in the Gospels and Holy Week. You can be one of the ten who kind of are there but not really in their background. You can be Peter who hangs in there for a while and even strikes out at the people coming to arrest Jesus. But by the end of Good Friday, what has he done? That's the best we can do, Nancy. That's the best anybody did in following Jesus through Holy Week, is to get to Friday night and bail. And probably the least admirable, but still in the loop, is Judas, who is almost exactly like Peter, except where Peter decided to shut it and follow Jesus to Jerusalem against his own judgment, Judas still used his best judgment. Judas decided, well, Jesus is clearly wrong, or he wants something to happen and he's afraid to ask us for it. So I'm just going to make this happen because he's going to win. He's going to win. I'm his follower. I'm not not his follower. I'm a follower of Jesus's, and he's going to win. So I'm just going to give him a push. That's the difference between Judas and Peter this week. Judas gives Jesus a little push, and Peter hangs in there until he can't. That's the best we can hope for for ourselves. Lest we have delusions of our own grandeur. And that's a hard message. It's one that I don't like to be the, uh, the Pony Express for, you know, the railroad for, but... Here we are. But I do think it's an important starting point. Because that's not our potential. We actually can do better than that. And they could have done better than that. But we are blinded by self-interest and self-preservation. And so I want to ask you, well, first, let me, let me state this, because I think this is self-evident. I, I just would urge you to consider this. There's no way that the people in my mind that rode into Jerusalem with Jesus are the same people that are on Good Friday calling out to Pontius Pilate to crucify Jesus. Do you know that? They're not the same people. The people on Palm Sunday traveled with him, grabbed friends and family on the way, called, you know, got, went on ahead and brought some people they knew out of the city, that's the home team. Palm Sunday, we get the home team. The best version of the home team, I just told you, is Peter. Those people are ski-daddled and gone by Friday. 
They are not in the crowd Friday. And why would they be? What's going to happen to them if they're in the crowd Friday shouting, let him go, let him go? They're going to be persecuted. But I ask you, each of you personally, wouldn't you take that deal now knowing what you know? Yeah. Like if you had the choice, if God gave you the ability to go back in time and God said to you, I'm going to give you the opportunity to stand up in that crowd and say, this is a bad idea. <laughs> Wouldn't you consider doing it? I mean, yes. your best self? Yes. You're going to get beat up. So, so what? So what? <laughs> if you knew then what that moment of history represented, if you could go back and, and grab on some coattails and say, you don't even know, this is a bad idea. It's like that TV show Quantum Leap when that guy goes <laughs> through history. If you could do that. I like to think I would, I would say, you know, why don't they just keep Barabbas? Just saying. No one did it. And the, the hard truth, the part that is hard to preach and hard to consider and is a confession is that I don't know that I would. I think if you gave me that quantum leap machine and I could go back and be there that day, there's just one of me. And there are hundreds of them. And he's a goner anyway. And I mean, I could raise my voice, but is anyone going to hear it? All I'm going to do is get beat up. I'm not going to change anything. I'm not going to be able to sway a crowd myself. Would I really? I mean, maybe. Maybe. Do I do it today? Not often. And I do know better. I don't know. I was talking to Susan earlier this week, and I, I don't know that we nailed a date down, but it's been many years since New Life had a full-time pastor. I don't know how many. More than 10. And one of the things that happens in a church that doesn't have a full-time pastor is every one of you has to get something done or no one will do it. And so for a decade, the people of New Life have rolled up their sleeves and just done what had to be done because no one else is going to do it. Am I wrong? I'm looking at some of you personally, and I know you do that. At a church that has a full-time pastor, people tend to knock on the door of the full-time pastor, say, do you got a minute? And I literally had this happen. John, I had this happen in Arkansas once. We had our property guy knock on my door. Right before church, knock on my door. I'll tell you who in the car. And... and Say, hey, can you come with me? It was like 10 minutes before worship started. <laughs> can you come with me for a minute? And we walked down through the hallways, and he got me into the corner of a hallway off by the educational wing of that property. And he went, look at that. And it was a dead cockroach. Oh, no. And he said, who's going to fix that? And I said, i got to go. <laughs> but that's how people act when there's a full-time pastor. If there's a problem they better get on it. And so I think one of the things that New Life has to figure out is how much of this, we, we're going to build this house around reliance on staff and service together, or we're gonna be the church we've always been and just roll up our sleeves and get stuff done. Because they are slightly different. And I would argue that New Life, you, are in a Palm Sunday moment of your history that you are at the precipice where you get to decide who you are going to be for the next decade. And that you are going to have to decide whether or not it's appropriate for me to be here 40 hours a week. And the only way, nothing you say with your mouth will influence that process. What will influence that process is how deeply you decide to serve and how you decide to serve. That's all that matters at this point. And so if you could have dropped down into that Good Friday 
cauldron, would you and what would you do? And this isn't that dramatic by any stretch, but it is a moment of choice. And you've been here 50 years this year, 50 years. This is probably the year you get to decide who you're going to become, more than any other, I think. And it won't be because I delivered a really nice message. And it won't be because we sit at tables, and it won't be because of the music. It'll be because you've looked inward and decided what you want to be and how you want this to be. You've got a couple choices, and I'm not going to judge any choice you make. Because honestly, I'm not sure that if you drop me down, I would have raised my voice to save Jesus. I probably would have wept and curled up into a ball. But this place can be a place that you come and you get encouragement. And you learn something. And you say, I never thought of that. And that's, that, that was good. I'm glad I came and I got to see my friend. And it was nice. And boy, I hope that we can keep this going. It's neat. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's almost, that is the Palm Sunday home crowd. 90% of our churches are filled with those folks who are Christians and faithful people. And most of them aren't in churches where that matters a great deal. You happen to be in one where it does. But there's nothing wrong with that. And I will never say, please don't misquote me. If that's what you decide you want and want to build, you'll build it. But I'm telling you today that this place, in order to grow and become the place that it can be, and I think that it probably has been, it's going to require more than that from you personally. Um, and you'll have to decide that. I met with nominating. Was that this week, Julie? It was this week, wasn't it? And we sat at that table over there, and after about an hour and a half, the nominating, nominating committee said to me, well, we don't have people. We, we're going to have empty slots of leadership because we don't have people. And we left it there. What we will have, as it stands now, we think we'll have enough people uh, to, to fill our session but our deacons board will probably, as it stands right now, not. And the deacons are really going to be charged with welcoming people, being hospitable to people, making sure when you walk in the door, you're greeted and you understand how things work and what you want to do and where the coffee is. And they're also going to make sure that if someone gets really sick, they get a phone call and a card and they know we care. And that's the board that right now we don't even have enough people to nominate someone to it. So, I mean, it's a, it's, you see the difference between I love my church and I come and I get something out of it and it's wonderful and I go back to my house and I tell my family what I learned and they go, wow, that's really cool. Or, man, they need me and something may happen to someone I care about and we don't have anybody in that slot to help them. What do I do, Lord? What, what do you want me to do? And the good news is, because I'm not going to leave you with just, see why I wore my robe today. I'm not going to leave you <laughs> with just the difficulty of that. Because there's good news in it. Because what did Peter end up becoming? I mean, he denied, he walked away. He was like, that church is asking more of me than I want to give. He walked away. Where was he within a week? Leading. So, you, you don't owe, I, I really don't believe you owe me a thing. I really don't believe you owe the church a thing. I really don't believe Jesus is sitting on high evaluating your response to what I'm saying. I think Jesus loves you and wants you to be well. But the reality is, there are nine churches in our denomination in Albuquerque. In 50 years, there won't be. I don't know how many there'll be. Maybe 20. Maybe four. But you have to decide if this is going to be one of them. 
And that's a lot to ask of you. It's more than I would ask of you when we're in a row. But it's the truth. You get to decide it. You get to decide where you stand, how you want it to grow, how you want it to look, and what you're willing to sacrifice to make it more. Or, Covenant's 1.9 miles away, and it'll be there. You get to decide. And um, that's the message I get when I read Palm Sunday, the reading from Mark, every year. I'm telling you this this year, but I hear this every year. Because every year, Palm, Palm Sunday happens, and the home crowd says, Yay, Jesus, we love you, yay, with no idea what's going to be asked of them. <laughs> with no idea what's going to go down within a few days. With no idea, probably, that Jesus is intending right then to head to the temple and make angry the only group that has the power to help him. He's going to be confrontational with even them. Yay, Jesus, we love you. You healed my uncle. You said some amazing things at the Mount by Galilee. You are amazing, and I want to follow you and see what you're going to say and do next. What? You're doing that? I'm going home. <laughs> I can go to the synagogue at home, and they're not going to ask this of me, and I can worship God there. Love you, though. It's hard. But even all of those people, I mean, what would you give just to have been a Fairweather fan? What, what would you have given to have been there that day and just watch one guy on one pony walk into a city that honestly, I mean, maybe it was the size of Las Cruces, maybe. It wouldn't look like nothing to you and me. But I'd, I'd give a lot to have seen it. So search your heart. This is Sunday of Holy Week. This is the week that comes clean about what's being asked of you. This is the week where we're told by Jesus, you don't have to change. You don't have to. You can go out into the night. You can leave from this table and go out into the night and betray me. It's fine. Finish your supper if you want. You can go. Or you can do better. You can do more. Jesus didn't kill Judas. Who killed Judas? Yeah. So my hope for you, and why I came here, was to help you have clarity in your decisions and to inspire you to attempt greater. And I, I have done that to the best of my ability, aiming at each one of you each Sunday. You know, I have, I have 30 little arrows in my quiver. And as I prepare every Sunday, I get ready to hit each one of you with that little arrow. And I pray that God will do what God's gonna do with those arrows so that when you go home, your life is better. And when, when you go home and your life is better, you go, man, that place is important. I need that place to be well. Today I'm not doing that. Today I got one thing for 30 people. And that one thing is take an assessment. Breathe deep. Be clear-headed. Clear and decide who you want to become and what you want to grow into. God will bless you either way. Now, we're going to do something I've never done. Makes me very nervous. <laughs> we're going to have communion at your table. Cool. And you are going to serve yourselves at your table. I would encourage each table to get a one, one person to serve and pass. Because we have nice tablecloths off. We, we did this to make it difficult for you. <laughs> um, I would pour my grape juice on the side, <laughs> not above. Um, but I'm going to offer the words of institution um, after our prayer. And I'm going to head over to my table and sit and wait. And when we're done, and I can see that you're prepared to move forward, we will. Does that make sense?
Please join me in the prayer of dedication. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to our God. Eternal God, you've created the heavens and the earth, giving breath to every living thing. We thank you for the gifts of creation and for life itself. We thank you for making us in your own image, for forgiving us when we act as though you have no claim on us, and for keeping us in your constant care. We rejoice in Jesus Christ, the only one eternally begotten by you, born of your servant Mary, who shared the joys and sorrows of our lives. We remember his death and celebrate his resurrection. And in the beloved community of your church, we await his return and the healing of the earth. We take courage from the abiding presence of your Holy Spirit in our midst. We offer you our prayers for women and men of faith in every age who stand as witnesses to your love and justice. Gracious God, we ask you to bless this bread and cup and all of us with the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Through this meal, make us the body of Christ, the church, your servant people, that we may be salt and light and leaven for the furtherance of your will in the world. Through him, with him, and in him, in the power of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor be to you, O God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he offered it to his disciples saying, this bread is my body broken for you. Each time you partake of it, do it remembering me. And in the same way, he took the cup and offered it to them saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the remission of sins. Drink ye all of it and remember Let's pray. Lord God, we often use this time to offer up our prayers of intercession to you for those things that we face as individuals in our lives. And those things are important. And we do lift them up to you. And we do pray that you will listen to our hearts as we are full of joy, hope, 
grief, suffering, whatever it is we've carried here today, that you see us and hear us in that moment. But today, of all days, we come as one family. And we come to you asking for you to help us to see your vision for us. That you would help us to better understand how we are asked to carry that which is sacred and let go of that which is not. Help us to learn to discern your will for us so that we can grow into the place that you have planned for us to be. We pray that each one of us as individuals would see with perspective that this family is more than just a collection of individuals, but it is one body. And we pray that you would help us to act in such a way that we begin to think hard and, and prayerfully about what our particular part in the body is. We know that we are quite close to Sandia Presbyterian, which is a big church that can do all kinds of things that only a large church can do. And we're literally right down the road from Covenant that is a family program church that does all sorts of activities for families, for children, for teens, for older people, all of us, because they have the ability to do that. They're big enough to do it. But we have a calling too. We have a purpose. We have a reason to be here. Help us to envision it together. Help that idea to catch fire and become something we talk about and build together as one body. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus the Christ who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's present our tithes and our offerings to God. As we do that, I'd like to talk to you while, while we do that. Can I do that? Okay, so when I arrived here, one of the things I saw even before I arrived in your DNA as a church family was your ability to think outside the box and to, to zig when everyone's zagging. And I created a lectionary for you for my first year here that was only here. And you all know about that. We walked through it. But we have another one this year. And really, it starts in earnest the week after Easter. So when we get together the week after Easter, what might we be talking about? Well, and this is why I'm telling you, you're going to want probably to get more familiar with your, your uh, table book that's on the cart. But I can tell you now, tax day. That's our message. May 16th, Sunday. Earth Day week and Tax Day. I picked out readings specifically to talk to you about Tax Day. Is there another church in Albuquerque that's going to do that? Is there another church in the country that's going to do that? How about the next week? Earth Day and Stewardship. How about the week after that? The Louisiana Purchase. Where, what other church in the country is going to talk about the Louisiana Purchase in worship? And their minister is going to say to them, I sweated over the readings from Scripture to help us talk about the... And when you come to my house after that Sunday for Thursday Night Bible Study, we will be talking about the Louisiana Purchase and the readings we read. Well, those are interesting. I bet they don't get any stranger. The week after that, Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo. Did you know that that is not the Independence Day for Mexico? <laughs> Thought it was. We're having the Lord's Supper on Cinco de Mayo. Uh, not on that day, but the day we're talking about it. 
Um, Mother's Day, the next week. And we'll wrap up the Sundays leading into Pentecost with a talk about Clara Barton. What other church is going to do that? You allow that. No one has come up to me in the year plus that I've been here and said, get back to the lectionary. <laughs> We're uncomfortable. These are weird messages. They're, they're off-putting. Why are we talking about these things? You have a place. They would never do that at Covenant. Peggy, are they going to go over the Louisiana Purchase or Clara Barton at Sandia? No. <laughs> and I guarantee you that the readings I picked, well, they made sense at the time. We'll see if they make sense when we do them. But, but I am doing what I'm doing, and I'm leading the way that I'm leading because it's who you have told me you need. You've made it clear to me in the communications I've had with you since before I got here. So as stark and difficult as the message is that I've given you today, and as much as it makes, I hope, you go home and think about long term, what are you hoping to have happen here and how are you part of it? It's been happening. It's not like I'm trying to get you to do something that you're not used to. We're odd. <laughs> We're odd already. <laughs> so, so all of this that I'm kind of putting on you is, if, if you're going to be yourselves, and you're going to create a church in which you are welcome and comfortable, and people like you are welcome and comfortable, you have to help make it. There is no one else. And I believe there are a lot of people out there that need it, but I can't do that by myself. It's not my job, my place, and I'd be sinning against God. I'd be doing you a disservice. To, I'd be, it'd be self-idolatry. If I just took up that for myself and said, I'm going to will this into existence on my own. This is your project. And I am here to help it happen. But mark today on your calendar the day that Jeff said with great clarity, this is our project together. Amen. 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 I'm ready for the doxology now. <laughs> We did. We snuck it while you had your back turned. <laughs> <laughs>